Uh, welcome back to the second day of the conference. Uh, I hope everyone had a, had a good night last night um, and is ready for, for another full day of conference. So we're going to get started with the first speaker, and this, this session is on cancer dynamics and game theory, and our first speaker is uh, Ofer Feinerman. So take it away. Uh, good morning. Uh, so my talk has nothing to do or very little to do with cancer nor games, <laughs> but, but maybe I, I found a few attachment points. Uh, so at my, my lab, we study collective behavior, and there are many examples uh, for grouping and being together. Uh, and perhaps one of the most intriguing that many people uh, like to ask is which is smarter? This, uh, all these, one of these uh, little birds here that make up the flock or the entire uh, big bird that we're seeing, which is the flock shape, okay, is, is, is becoming smarter, one of the advantages of grouping together. Uh, so now if we look at the bird flocks, it's a bit uh, difficult to answer th this question. First, because it's not clear to date uh, why these birds are flocking. So, so there's not a clear goal of what they're doing. And second, that uh, if we want to compare an individual to the entire flock, right, they live in, in quite uh, different uh, worlds, and we need to find some kind of task that the individual does and the group also does, so that one individual can do alone and the group can do together, and then maybe we can compare which does it better and did the individual bird gain from, from, from uh, flocking. So, so flocking is not the best option here. Again, we have no clear goal. We don't know what, exactly what they're doing. Uh, but here's another behavior. So uh, in my lab, uh, we study mostly ants. And ants, we know when they find the pieces of food, they, we, they can uh, grab them and take them home alone. Okay, so, so here's one thing the ants do alone. They grab pieces of food and they go and they navigate back home. But ants also do this together. When they do this together, okay, so, so it's the same task. Now they, it's too big to carry alone. They carry it together, and then they run into all kinds of problems, like carrying this uh, large cricket through this narrow gap, okay? And how should they do it? Okay, it's not, it's not a simple thing, okay? This is some kind of, of, uh, of challenge, of mental challenge, if you want. So, so we can actually turn it into a riddle, into a puzzle where we can try to quantify, okay, what are they doing and how do they, how do they solve puzzles and what happens at the single individual level and at the group level. Okay, so, so instead of, of uh, looking at, at this uh, nice uh, natural scene that I showed you before, uh, we constructed a more controlled uh, riddle for the ant, and it's called the piano movers problem, so it's, it's a famous puzzle, it's a famous puzzle in uh, motion planning and computer science, okay, where you have to take a piano, it's, it's the problem in the mover space when they have to move a piano into a, into a small uh, room, right, through, through corridors and stuff. And, and this is our version of the piano movers puzzle. Okay, so this red thing is the piano. This is uh, the home. And actually here, yeah, the piano has to be removed from the home, not entered into the home. So what the ants have to do is take the piano through the, from the first chamber, through the second chamber, and towards the nest. So they think this piano is food, they make it smell like food, so they carry it, and they want to carry it towards the nest, and this is success. And now, while you're looking at the puzzle, you can try to solve it in your head before you see the solution. And now the nice thing about this puzzle, you can still try solving it while I speak. Uh, the nice thing about this puzzle is it's completely geometrical, it's completely scalable. So you can give a tiny version of this puzzle uh, to one ant on the left-hand side, or we can give a large version of the same exact same puzzle, needs the exact same things to choose it, to, to a large group of ants, which we see on the right side. Okay, so let's see how they do it. So here's a single ant. And the fact it says, so you can see she easily moves it. it it's no problem. It's not too heavy for her. Okay, this was 3D printed, and it's very light material. And she tries to remove it from, from the house to the mover's truck. And the reason it says single ant and not single ant, because you see, from time to time, she, she will disappear. Actually, she sees there's a problem. She goes to recruit uh, help. And when help comes, we only let one ant back. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so this is a single ant. Uh, we did see one time a solution, but very rare. 
And now let's look at many and solve it. So now it's a huge object after recruitment already. And this is from the beginning of motion. Try one way, it doesn't go through, they turn around. Try the other way. There. And here they go. Okay. So, so in, in this, uh, Uh, in this graph, we, we can see uh, this is the, the accumulated path length, and this is the, the, the chance that the, the, the problem was solved by this uh, path length. Okay, so this, the, the more you are to the left, the better you are. And we see the large group prefers much, much better than the small group. The small group is actually not a single ant, it's a group of a few ants, but they do very similar to, few, to a single ant. Okay. Uh, okay, so why are many ants better there than one? So microscopically, what do the ants do? So I'll, I'll go over it very, very shortly. Sorry. So you can see, I hope, no, it doesn't work, okay. So, so you can see that the ants here are moving to the right. So this is a snapshot of the ants moving to the right, and you can see that the thing is actually tilted. Why? The ants in the front are pulling, and the ants in the back are lifting, okay? So, so instead of fighting and tug of warring, they're actually coordinating very well. Okay, this is why this thing is slanted. So actually what the ants are doing, they conform, okay? So they feel the force that the object is applying to them and they conform to the force and they pull in the same direction. Okay, and the social pressure to conform grows with group size. So the larger the object, okay, the larger the force is, the more the ants tend to conform. Okay, so this is very, very, very briefly what happens microscopically. Okay, so what happens inside the puzzle? Inside the puzzle means that in a small group, what we're getting is like a biased random walk. So these are, are, are points where the, the load hits this front door, and this is where it left it. So you can see it hits the door, it squiggles here for a while, and then leaves it at about the same location. Okay, so it just does a biased random walk. And, and this is what the large group is doing. They hit the door first in a, in a, in a this, so this is an overlay of many trials. So you see many of them hit the door in exactly the same location. And then what they do is not squiggle here, but they move along this uh, wall all the way here. And this is a very major bottleneck in solving the puzzle. Okay, so we have this kind of wall following algorithm. Okay, and wall following, we know it's a heuristic to solve puzzles. Okay, so we have this emerging heuristic like the right hand rule. Put your right hand on the wall, and this way you solve the puzzle. Okay, and, and this, so, so this is very shortly how, how the ants do better. And now we're going to go to, to like cooperative transport is, is a very, very rare phenomenon in nature. Almost no other animal does it except for about 100 species of ants. So we chose one. And there's another species that does it. And it's, it's uh, this one here. Uh, so let's see. We, we build the same uh, puzzle just for people. Okay, so, so, so here's an individual. the same mistakes as the ants. Even this mistake is one that the ants didn't make, actually. And gets out. Okay, so actually when we ran it for people, uh, people do better than ants. Okay, so again, this is the more you are to the left, the better you are. But I want you to know this. Uh, we're blind. We, uh, I don't think we have the, the, I'm not allowed to do it. People, or for people under this height. <laughs> so, so there's also a height limitation. Uh, but I want you to know this. Uh, there's an overlap. <laughs> so people do better than ants on average. <laughs> uh, okay, so why, why are people better than ants? So, so this is a, a model uh, we suggest, uh, and, and, it, and it goes uh, quite a far way to explain things. So we think people uh, group many configurations, like all these configurations in phase space, they group them into a single node. So people understand that this is like this is like this. It means like you are fully contained in the first room and the large uh, bar of the T is, is stored at the front. So all these are a single node. And then actually the solution, once you move it into nodes, you reduce phase space. And now people have this kind of maps in their mind and they have to explore this map. Okay, how do I move from this node and I have to reach this node? Okay, so it's not clear which node is connected to which node. You, see, you can see the solution in green. And this is what people have to figure out. 
And we can see, for example, one thing that strengthens this, when people move from node A to node C, they kind of take the, the shortest path, like you see here. So they take the shortest path, and they actually, if you compare to ants, you can see that the large ant group is kind of similar to people, while a small one is not. So large ant groups are a bit like, like uh, human beings. So actually, the, so people take the shortest path between these uh, nodes, and actually what they do is very similar to a depth first search on this graph. Okay, so I won't go into the details. And now, so this is a single person, now we give it to many people. <laughs> One six people, this thing is large, like, not, like 75%, let's say, of the, of the, the arena of, the, of this uh, hall. <laughs> and the people are not allowed to talk, so we have two conditions. Here they're not allowed to talk at all or communicate. The person there is, is uh, kind of policing this so they don't communicate. And here we see a solution. Okay, so this is a single person, and these are, are groups that are not allowed to communicate. So we get worse. P many people do worse than one. Why are many people worse than one? So microscopically, actually, and for each of these people, we had a force meter. So the people were... Ah, I'm, wait, I'm on time, I think. So people have a force meter, and, and we can see when they pull. So actually, what we see is that people, some of the people start pulling again, and then the other people conform with them. Okay, so some people... So until this point, after movement even starts, there's kind of a tug of war, because the blue are pulling front and the red back, and then at some times the reds conform. Okay? So, they are, so the people actually, very much like ants, or probably you felt it when you carry something big, you actually go with the group, you conform, you don't want to fight the other people who might know what they're doing. And this goes with the second thing, people simplify their decisions. Okay? So because they have to reach consensus and they cannot speak, they try to reach the simplest consensus, and we see here, so for each decision point, there's the greedy option, means try to go as fast as you can towards the exit, or the, the indirect option where you try to take kind of a, a roundabout, and the black are single people, and the greens are the groups, non-communicating groups. So the gr non-communicating groups are always greedy, so people try to compromise. They don't go where they, where they would have gone had they been alone. Not if, we don't even get the majority here. The majority of people want to go uh, down, but when they group, they actually go up, okay? So, so they change their, their, not that they do majority voting or something, they actually change their opinion towards being greedy. And that's why, why they do worse. Okay, so, so to summarize, let's start with, with the ants. Individual ants are very limited, okay? So, so they don't have uh, brains like we do. And this means when they, when they come into this puzzle, they don't know the details of the puzzle. They don't know anything. They, 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 when they have to identify what they have to do, this is just, okay, now we are at a, at a scenario, which is a scenario of cooperative transport. We have to do cooperative transport now, and all the ants go to these rules of conforming that I told you very briefly about. So all the ants are actually on the same page. They're all trying to, to do cooperative transport, carry the thing together. So actually, it's very easy to cooperate, because all the ants are actually following the same rules. And, and, uh, and that's what they do. They follow rules. They, 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 feel where the force is going, so the force applied by other ants, by the, by the load, and they just go with this, uh, with this force. Uh, so very easy to cooperate. And then you get some group, emergent heuristic, that actually works for this puzzle. But also we've been working at this system for, for 10 years now. We, we threw many puzzles at these ants, and it's highly, highly robust. You also saw the natural movie at the beginning. Highly robust, which is nice because the ants are... are uh, they, they, don't, they don't distinguish between different cooperative transport scenarios, so it's good. The, the, the collective algorithm they come up with is very general and very robust to different, uh, different environments. Okay, so this is what ants do. People are very capable, but then the, the, the scenario identification is very fine. Okay, so one person thinks, okay, I should go right first, and the other say, no, I, 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 I know this from my house. I already did something like that. I should go left first. So people have a lot of different strategies, uh, and then it's difficult to coordinate uh, and this requires communication. So actually, uh, this slide was somehow missing, but when we allow the people to communicate, we, we, save the, okay, so we save the group so they again act, perform like a single individual. So now, this requires communication to, to, to cooperate, and if the if people do not, are not allowed to communicate, they actually dump their self, themselves up, they go to the most simple, most evident solution just to reach consensus, and this means deteriorated performance. So I'd just like to thank uh, my group and also the people that were uh, listed on, on the first slides, the authors of this paper. One of them is sitting here, Amir Khalutz. Uh, and thank you for listening.
question while the next speaker comes up? We just put a piece of, a, of a plastic in cat food overnight, and they think it's food. So now they want to take it to the nest. That's it. So the payment is the food that they think they're going to get. This is food. It's, it just smells like food. They think it's a big piece of food. People would just tell them, this is what you have to do. <laughs> Not allowed. <laughs> this event, people have a very, very, very strong urge to communicate. Actually, so we have to have some somebody there policing them, and uh, so we don't hit them for doing it. So sometimes it happens a bit, but we really restrict. Every time we see them, we say, "Well, oh, that's not allowed. That's not allowed." So they have both hands, and they have sunglasses. They have uh, COVID masks. Uh, so we minimize communication, and and uh, we really see a different effect. So so really different uh, errors that people make when they communicate and when they don't communicate. Uh, is, the, is the next speaker here, uh, Stephanie? Okay. These microphones are w made for people that are way taller than me. Hello, everybody. I'm Stephanie Puentes, and today I'm excited to um, welcome you to my talk, which is titled Insight into the Coordination of the Bacterial Cycle Through the Protein Party. Still not cancer. Um, let's start with a problem that every, um, every cell faces, the maintenance of the chromosome. Chromosomes must be inherited faithfully every single time as a basis of life, no matter the type of cell it is. However, bacterial cells face additional challenges, namely that they have tiny vessels, that they need to do processes like concurrent replication and segregation of their chromosomes, and they also need to accommodate fast growth. So my thesis focuses on how bacteria um, focus on this coordination, and in my lab, we strive to understand the bacterial cell cycle, and we use Colobacter crescentis as our model organism for the reason that um, Colobacter initiates replication only once per cell cycle, and that allows us to track um, when replication has initiated. We track replication by putting a fluorescent tag on a protein that binds close to the origin of replication, and then we track um, the localization of this protein as a focus in the cell. So every time that you see a green dot in my presentation, it's going to count, count as an origin of replication. This is what it looks like in vivo, where two ori separate and then you have, um, they move to opposite sides of the cell. For my thesis, I only focus on the initiation of replication and the onset of segregation, so we will be zooming in on these processes. This is how chromosome replication, initiation, and segregation work in Colobacter. In the chromosome, we have the origin of replication and eight kilobases away, a centromere-like region called PAR-S. PAR-B binds to PAR-S directly, and I'll be referring to this complex as the centromere from now on for simplicity. Um, then replication initiates at ORI. The ORIs are separated, but it isn't until the region nearby PARS is replicated uh, that the centromere is segregated, and that's done by PAR-A, which is an active chromosome segregator protein that pulls the centromere to the opposite pole. At the end, you have a cell with two centromeres anchored at each pole. For my talk, I'll be giving an overview on two of my findings. The first one is that PAR-A levels alter chromosome replication initiation, and the second is that PAR-A is involved in the release of the centromere. So let's focus into the first one. As I told you, Colobacter initiates replication only once per cell cycle. Here are some cells expressing an empty vector, and as expected, they show one or two um, centromeres, which correlate to the number of chromosomes in the cell. But when we alter the levels of PAR-A, we have cells with more than two chromosomes um, in the cell. And this told us that PAR-A, the active um, segregator, actually has roles in replication initiation. And we're still investigating the mechanism for this phenomenon. Now let's dive into my second finding, which is that PAR-A is involved into the release of the centromere. We have explored different PAR-A variants, and most of them over-initiate replication. 
But then we explored two variants in the DNA binding domain of PARA. When mutated to a non-polar residue, we see over-initiation. But when we mutate it to a negatively charged residue, we still see over-initiation but no release from the pole. So we went on to investigate the interactions at the pole. In the cell pole, the centromere is anchored um, by a protein at the pole, which I have de depicted in purple. And we first disrupted the interaction between PAR-B and the anchor, and we still saw that there was a release defect. But then we disrupted the interaction between PAR-A and the anchor, and now the centromeres were um, able to be released, which was very interesting because PAR-A was not known to have a role in the release um, of uh, the centromeres, and showed us that PAR-A has many roles beyond active chromosome segregation. To wrap up, these are two of my findings that I'll share with you today. And as final remarks, I just wanted to share with you um, how carefully coordinated the cell cycle is, even when just zooming in on a tiny bit of it. How remarkable it is that cells manage to do all of these so fast and with such little room for mistakes, and how we still have fundamental questions to be answered. Thank you. Um, quick question. So for now, we do know that it is my, the protein that does active chromosome segregation actually talking to the protein that initiates replication. DNA. Yes, with DNAA. So we're, we're investigating how these two talk together. And it was very interesting because nobody thought that downstream processes were actually affecting the very initiation of these processes. Nice. Okay. Um, So as far as um, depicting the literature, it was thought to, that PARA is only attracted to the opposite pole. But what we're seeing is that it's actually attracted to both poles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, it's definitely um, a, a matter of dimerization. And we're thinking that the protein that is at the poles is actually helping through the dimerization of the protein to convert it from inactive to active. So we're investigating that as well. Yes, yes, it does. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, we have to go to the next speaker. You just have um, to follow can... the pink dress if you have more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Yitong from Yale University, uh, U.S. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, computational modeling of breast cancer cell invasion into adipose tissue. Uh, so let's look at the system I'm trying to model. Uh, here are two, uh, so breast cancer usually they originated from the milk duct, and uh, as they grow, they may break the duct and uh, start to invade the tissue outside. Uh, the tissue outside is the adipose tissue, and uh, they mostly composed of uh, adipocytes or fat cells. Uh, those cells are uh, the mo uh, those cells are mostly lipid or oil, so they are deformable and uh, incompressible. And the tumor tissue mostly composed of uh, tumor cells, and uh, those cells are uh, sticky, uh, soft, uh, deformable, and uh, motile. They can migrate actively. So. In the middle, there are two images um, taken from uh, mice that has breast cancer. It's the images are focusing on the frontier of the cell uh, of the cancer invasion. The white ones on the left are adipose, are adipose tissue, and the reddish 
purple cells on the on on the right are uh, cancer cells. Um, yeah, and uh, the other two cartoons are uh, slides from our computational models. Uh, we can see that sometimes uh, the system can uh, the 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 interface between the two tissue is uh, sharp and clean, and the two tissues are separated. The adipose tissue remains uh, intact, while in other cases, the cancer cells can get into the gaps between adipocytes, and uh, the whole tissue the whole adipose tissue is broken down. And we want to ask the following question. How would different physical factors impact the degree of invasion? Uh, so I'm working on a computational team, uh, lab, and uh, so my job is to uh, build a 3D computational model to uh, simulate uh, this invasion process. And uh, our collaborator, they induce uh, breast cancer on mice and uh, get images from it. The problem with that is, uh, uh, so the the experiment serves as uh, ground truth, but they can they can they, but it's very hard for them to see the three D structure, the time evolution, and they can change the parameters uh, arbitrarily. Uh, so this is uh, our uh, computational model. Uh, we model adipose size as uh, deformable um, particles. So a deformed particle is basically a polyhedron that has many vertices, and uh, each a deep size has a preferred uh, volume and surface, and when its true value is different from its preferred value, we employ a, um, we apply a, a quadratic energy penalty. So this makes the deformed particle deformable and uh, incompressible. And uh, for cancer for cancer cells, we model them as uh, uh, self-propelled particles. They are soft. Uh, sticky and, and motile, they can migrate uh, acti actively. Uh, our results are summarized uh, in the in the archive paper, and you can see that uh, if you scan the QR code, or you can reach out to me through this uh, um, email address. Um, so uh, basically, what we found are here. Um, uh, the first result is pretty uh, trivial if you look at the figure. Uh, the faster cancer cells migrate, uh, the more invasive, the more aggressive they are. And, uh, and then we also show that uh, uh, when as cancer cells get uh, sticky, this critical, uh, this critical invasion speed uh, in also increases. So this suggests that uh, sticky cancer cells are less invasive. And we also studied the uh, packing fraction of the adipose tissue and the stiffness of adipocytes. We found out that uh, densely packed adipocytes, uh, adipose tissue and uh, stiff adipocytes are harder to invade. We also studied the heterogeneity of the adipose tissue, and uh, the answer is uh, it depends. It depends on which mechanical properties we are talking about the heterogeneity here. And it also depends on the uh, spatial distribution of the mechanical properties. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my PI, my uh, lab mates, and our collaborator, and our funding resources. Thank you. And let's have the next speaker come up as well. Yeah, please. Yeah, so in, in, yeah, in the real world, there's uh, not only cells, there's also fibers to, to, to collect them together. Yeah, so uh, we also model that, and uh, uh, the way we model that is to connect the adipose cells uh, together so that they don't uh, easily fall apart. And, uh, and also, those uh, extracellular matrix, they have, in, uh, they have influence on the uh, cancer cell migrations. Uh, that, that, that we haven't modeled, but we will do that in the uh, future. Please. Uh, it's purely mechanical. Good morning, everyone. I'm Simone Scalise, a PhD student in physics at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. 
in collaboration with the Italian Institute of Technology. Today I will show you how can infer the, div the division strategy of leukemia cancer cell population. Despite the large number of existing cells, all of them are subject to a series of processes that allow them to grow and divide. The balance of these processes uh, lead to the achievement and maintenance of homostatic size. The importance of heterogeneity in the size distribution of cancer cell population has been recently linked to drug resistance and invasiveness. From a cell dynamics reduction in point of view, the strategy allowing seismostasis can be roughly grouped into three classes, sizer, under, <coughs> other, and timer, which differ for what triggered the division, the size, the increased volume, or the timer respectively. This strategy can be uh, <coughs> in, uh, identified knowing the relationship between the size at birth and division, which means follow the proliferation of single cell level as is done for fast prolifer proliferating cells like bacteria and yeast, but it's more difficult for uh, mammalian cells due to the uh, larger time scale of proliferation. We are able to infer the division strategy of leukemia cancer cell uh, using the live cell for instance labeling and flow cytometry in combination with a quantitative computational model. Uh, the model is based on two main assumptions that both growing division rate dep uh, uh, depends on power of cell size. In this way, uh, simply changing the value of the parameter alpha and beta, we are able to uh, identify the three different strategies uh, using a simulation. The experimental protocol is based on flow cytometry measurement. Uh, the uh, cultured cells are stained with uh, a fluorescent dye that binds to the uh, cell cytoplasm. And using a uh, flow cytometer, we are able to isolate, uh, isolate the desired cells from the whole cell population. Uh, we select only the cells with uh, fluorescent intensity around the max peak of the fluorescent distribution. In this way, we collect the highest number of cells with the same intensity of the uh, fluorescence. We put in back, uh, put in culture the, um, the cells and take an adequate of them at pre-established time in order to follow the decrease in time of the fluorescent uh, intensity uh, distribution. From this distribution, using a Gaussian mixture model and our expectation maximization algorithm, we are able to associate each peak of the distribution to a different generation. So we know for each analyzed cells the probability to uh, belong to a different generation in time. From this data, we are able to ident identify different things. First of all, we uh, follow the division of the cell cytoplasm, seeing that it happens in a symmetric way. Also, we uh, identify the subpopulation in the forward size scattering distribution. Forward size scattering is a value that can be associated to a proxy of the cell size. Last, we uh, uh, can reconstruct the uh, fractional cells that belong to the different generation in time. Using these fractional cells, the average uh, size of the whole population time and the mean size for each generation as constrained for our model, we can obtain the best uh, parameter for our uh, fit. And for Joka cell line, we found alpha equal to 1 and beta equal to 6, which, which means that follow a sizer like uh, trend. Moreover, we investigate all cells uh, respond to a different growth environment uh, by culturing them under nutrient starvation. And uh, we see that cells tend to adapt uh, to the environment, uh, maintain the same uh, model, simply changing the rate of growing division. Uh, adapting uh, with uh, different response time depending on the level of starvation. Thank you all. Uh, we investigate all the all. Mm, uh, suspension cell, so JURCAT and uh, um, THP1, uh, because flow cytometer works better when, with uh, uh, suspended cells for the, for the uh, type of uh, analytics. And uh, so we, it's, it's a work uh, on which we are, we are seeing. <coughs>
good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Leonardo Gasso. I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Turin. And uh, today I'll talk to you about uh, microRNAs and uh, whole genome duplications. So first of all, what is a whole genome duplication? Whole genome duplication is a process that duplicates the whole genome of an organism. Usually, uh, this is a dead end in, uh, in evolution, since it produces uh, a deleterious effect on the, on the phenotype. But it's uh, nowadays uh, well established that uh, uh, two rounds of uh, whole genome duplication in the early vertebrates uh, lineage uh, boosted the size and the complexity of the vertebrate genome. Uh, in, the, in the human genome, one can find uh, pairs of uh, the whole genome duplicated pairs that are called analogs, and we'll call paralogs the, the genes that are duplicated after simple small scale duplications. And uh, um, one can find uh, about uh, 120,000 uh, paralog protein coding genes uh, versus uh, uh, about 9,000 uh, protein coding uh, Homolog protein coding gene pairs. Oh, sorry. MicroRNAs, on the other end, are uh, small uh, non coding uh, uh, RNAs that uh, in eukaryotic uh, organism uh, regulates uh, the, the, um, the gene expression at the post transcriptional level by inhibiting the um, translation of uh, messenger uh, RNAs. And uh, the first uh, step of my job. Uh, of my work was uh, to identify uh, analog microRNA pairs since uh, the available resources on uh, analog genes uh, uh, just uh, take into account protein coding genes. So what I did was to check inside uh, analog gene pairs for uh, uh, analog gene pairs that host microRNAs in both the gene of the pairs and uh, assuming these microRNAs uh, were duplicated together with, uh, with their host gene. And the first thing I did after retrieving a list of uh, uh, whole genome duplicated microRNAs, I checked for similarities in their sequences and compared and compare it to uh, similar microRNAs uh, uh, hosted on uh, simple paralog protein coding genes. Uh, and what I observed is that uh, microRNA pairs hosted on uh, analog gene pairs uh, have a higher sequence similarity. One can imagine that uh, microRNAs uh, on uh, paralog gene pairs, uh, microRNA pairs, each dot is a pair, uh, hosted on uh, paralog gene pairs uh, uh, are just a false positive of our analysis, but a much more likely explanation is that uh, they, at least some of them, uh, actually duplicated together with their host genes, uh, but underwent a rapid uh, evolutionary divergence. And my intuition is that uh, if you duplicate a microRNA, uh, but you don't duplicate the whole set uh, of its target, uh, that is something that is possible uh, only after a whole genome duplication, uh, you are more likely to produce deleterious effect uh, due to stoichiometric imbalance. Then, uh, from a network theory perspective, I try to understand the role of these uh, homolog microRNA pairs uh, in uh, microRNA messenger RNA interaction networks, um, checking if they are enriched in particular subgraph called network motif that are somehow relevant to the gene regulation network. In order to do so, I generated a null model randomizing the original interaction network 10,000 times, uh, preserving the, the degree of each node since uh, my uh, honor microRNA display a higher out degree compared to uh, to general microRNAs. What I observed is that uh, analog microRNA pairs are enriched in particular subgraphs like v motive that just tell us that uh, they tend to regulate the same gene targets. But uh, more, is, more interestingly, uh, they are also enriched in mo more complex uh, motifs like uh, bifen with protein-protein uh, interaction uh, between the, uh, the target genes. Uh, that are, these, uh, these motifs are, are um, related to uh, stoichiometric balance because uh, for uh, complex uh, proteins, you have to uh, cooperate uh, in the regulation of the, of the um, subdomains of the protein in order to maintain a correct ratio and uh, not produce uh, uh, stoichiometric imbalance. And this result is even more, uh, more relevant observing that single microRNAs were, were not observed in a pairs uh, 
do not display an enrichment in, uh, in motifs like this delta motif, so a uh, microRNA is targeting a pair of, uh, of uh, gene that uh, interact at the protein-protein level. That's it, thank you very much. Excuse me. It's nice to see a lot of old friends here and some new faces. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Let's see. Uh, oops. How did I go backwards? Okay. I guess this will work. Okay, all right, thank you. Anyways, um, good. Um, I am actually going to talk about game theory here, and the, the fundamental theory, um, equation for game theory is shown right here. Uh, it's the growth rate, uh, carrying capacity, and death. Um, so what happens in game theory at a very simple level is the cell type uh, competes for a carrying capacity in a tumor versus other cell types uh, via some competition coefficient A, J, K. Uh, the effective growth rate at low densities decreases with approach to the carrying capacity. That slows down. That's the fundamental thing. Um, basically, you can sort of view them as fermions, and that's why the growth rate slows down as you uh, approach the carrying capacity. Uh, unfortunately, according to modern game theory, all of us should be dead or starving at this point. What I mean by that is uh, Paul Ehrlich published a very famous book in 1968 called the Population Bomb, which said the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash program embarked upon. At this late date, in 1968, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. He won a MacArthur Fellowship. He's a genius, eminent ecological award in the Crawford Prize in Bioscience. Great man. He also has really bad uh, sideburns. <laughs> So what went wrong with that? What's, why, why are we all here? Um, and there's a couple things that he screwed up on. One is the birth rate, uh, the growth rate, RJ. He assumed that would be constant, but actually it's been decreasing with time, as you can see here. Actually, for many countries right now, they are quite worried that the um, growth rate has now gone below um, the normal weight to replace the population. Japan, South Korea, and other countries are actually profoundly worried about about that right now. Uh, more, a bigger mistake he made was he assumed that the carrying capacity was a constant, but actually it's a complex quantity which is not time invariant, no more than growth rates or death rates are fixed. Making predictions is difficult, especially about the future, a famous quote by Niels Bohr. I'm going to talk now about cancer. We're going to leave Paul Ehrlich and there are basically three carrying capacities in cancer to worry about, uh, called the three Ks. The first one is simply in a tumor, there's a maximum density of the cells per unit area. They're fermions. It's likely to reach very quickly and influenced by the tumor size. The second one is how big the tumor can get, and that's scaled by uh, oxygen diffusion and then the um, um, network of... Uh, blood cells of, of blood flow that can uh, accommodate that growth. That's another carrying capacity. The older carrying capacity, the ultimate K, is that typically humans turn about 0.1% of their body mass over per day. 
you can only sustain about 0.2%. If you get burned very seriously, the reason why you die is that you just simply cannot replace the skin that fast. It's too, bad of a, too big of a metabolic load for the body to withstand. For cancer, you can compute what that would be. If you assume that the immune system is attacking the cancer and you have a turnover rate of cancer cells at so many per day, and you go ahead and look at from that figure I gave you, 0.2% is the most number of cells your body can replace per day, you find out that a typical lethal size for a tumor is about 750 grams, about two pounds. And that's done by the third carrying capacity. We'll now move to a cancer which luckily has a measure, however imperfect, of the number of cancer cells. That's a critical thing in cancer. Uh, and that can be measured for prostate cancer, one of the few ones, via the PSA num number, which is the prostate-specific antigen. It's antigen found circulating in the blood, which may be a measure of the total number of cancer cells in a tumor, but at least it gives you a measure of that. And if you're going to do game theory, you need to know the number of agents that are competing for a space for one of these three Ks. To do game theory, you, know, you need to know the number and phenotype of the players in the game. So in, I will go to a spherical cow model here and say we just have two players in the prostate cancer game. One is a drug-sensitive cancer cell, NS. They are not invasive. They won't kill you because, one, their growth is limited by carrying capacity of the local density and the oxygen diffusion, but not the third one. And they are, in fact, drug sensitive. So drugs actually work with them that knock them down. The other one is the resistant cells. The resistant cells have a different growth rate, but they are not sensitive to the drug. They will continue to grow. So you can write down two coupled nonlinear differential equations here for the sensitive cells competing against the resistant cells, the first equation there and the resistant cells competing with the sensitive cells for carrying capacity. And they have different carrying capacities. There are weeds here. This looks like a simple set of differential equations you can solve on any laptop computer, but it's not so trivial. PSA is a measure of testosterone. Sensitive cells need testosterone for survival, which is connected to the androgen signaling network. If you deprive them of androgen, testosterone, the carrying capacity decreases. Androgen-depriving drugs are better than toxic drugs, but men don't like them at all because they feminize them, and however, they're better than the alternative, castration. Abby acetone inhibits the androgen receptors of cells to disrupt androgen signaling employed by prostate cancers. I'm now talking about stage four cancer here. These guys have no plan B anymore. They have sensitive cells, they have incident, and insensitive cells competing against one another. And the question is, who's going to win that game? You can go ahead here and map out the basic phenomenon that's going on here. When you give a drug, the sensitive cells will decrease. However, the insensitive cells will increase. At some point, there's a tipping point where the insensitive cells exceed the number of the sensitive cells. That's the big red arrow here. Beyond that, the uh, inexplicable, the unfortunate thing that must happen here is that this, the insensitive cells will dominate over the sensitive cells, even in the presence of drug, and eventually take over and you go to the carrying capacity three. So if you don't do anything in prostate cancer, what happens here is if you've already passed that tipping point as measured by PSA levels, it's just a matter of time before the insensitive cells dominate and achieve the third carrying capacity, which this body cannot tolerate anymore. Your tipping point has been passed. When you apply Abby to a patient, what you're doing is you're dropping the carrying capacity of the sensitive cells. So that's that gamma factor there in the, in the denominator of my equation. So applying Abby to the cancer decreases the carrying capacity of the sensitive cells and does not affect the carrying capacity of 
the insensitive cells. So what will happen then in that case is that the PSA level will drop initially because you remove the sensitive cells, presumably are dominant at the start. And that goes on for a while. You're miserable, but they say you're in remission. But the tipping point inevitably must be reached, in which case the insensitive cells will exceed the number of the sensitive cells, which are keen, kept down by the drug, and they will dominate, and then you proceed to have exponential growth and proceed to carrying capacity number three. This is the way that they treat prostate cancer right now. It's the maximum tolerated dose. Unfortunately, stage four, Prostate cancer is incurable and almost inevitably lethal for the reasons I'm showing you here, even in the hands of an expert oncologist. There's a fundamental instability here. Removing the rapidly growing testosterone-dependent cells, S, buys you time. Yes, it does. But it opens the gate for the growth of the slower-growing resistant cells, which no longer have to compete against the sensitive ones. I used to think, having discovered evolution independently of Darwin, that the tumor evolved de novo resistance, but probably in the case of Abbey, Abbey resistance, it was there all along and well adapted. I'm not really sure about that. The key idea here behind adaptive chemotherapy is to maintain the sensitive cells at a high level because they knock down the resistant cell growth by that competition effect. So the strange thing is, our advice to the oncologist is don't knock down the PSA level, give minimum dose, keep the PSA level high, maintain a high level of sensitive cells as long as you possibly can. You want to then modulate the drug dose adaptively, sampling the PSA to keep actually the PSA level high, not low, which is crazy. But when you take a look at that, you find out what you're doing is, because you're playing game theory now, and you're keeping the sensitive cells high, you're able to keep the resistant cell population down for a period of time. For the case here I'm showing here of Gatby and Brown, you gain about 50 days out of around um, 2,000 days. Not too great. The question is, why did they do it at a 50% level of PSA level? Why was that done? And the answer was, they really had no reason for that at all. So what we've done as physicists is we've gone ahead and used Bayesian um, um, optimization thing, techniques to try to optimize what is the optimum dosage to keep the PSA level high, where should you place it? So you can go ahead and do that, and you find out there's an optimum point, and maybe it's not too surprising you, that the optimum point is to keep it as high as you can, just below the, um, the um, level three uh, stage of bond being on, the, be able, uh, the body being unable to do it, but still be able to cope with that. So that what happens then is instead of going to that rough seesaw, we actually let the PSA level go very high and keep sampling all the time. Eventually, the resistance cells must win. But the time to gain before the uh, inevitable tipping point is reached for that air there is now quite a, bit more, uh, quite a bit more days, 275 days rather than 50 days, using this scheme of adaptive game theoretical approaches. Hope I'm making some sense here, what I'm saying to you. This is a good thing. There's a lot of security here at this site, because actually we just did a series of delta function dosages near the tipping point. The total drug delivered was less than 100 times at the continuous mean tolerated dose level, and the patient quality of life would be greatly improved if you simply give them a lot less drug adaptively, infrequently. Don't tell Big Pharma you're taking money from them. I've ignored here, by the way, the alpha terms. The alpha terms are the competition terms. I have set them equal to one. It isn't necessarily true that the competition terms are equal to one. It's possible that the sensitive cells are able to compete more effectively against the resistant cells. So if alpha SR is greater than alpha RS, it is possible actually to never reach a tipping point. That comes out of the equations. In other words, by that, if certain lucky patients, as we sample their response functions, and we determine these values, it's possible that that person can actually become chronic and he will never ever cross the tipping point. 
because we're simply keeping the sensitive cells at a high enough level to compete effectively against the resistant ones. They're going to keep taking drugs for the rest of their lives, but they will never cross over to the tipping point and the carrying capacity number three. That's our prediction. That's what we think can happen. All models are wrong, but some are useful. I would say this is perhaps a useful model. There are liars, damn liars, <laughs> Donald Trump, and cancer models. There's a lot of weeds here I'm not showing you, but I'm trying to show you there is some hope for completely rethinking the way we deliver drugs for this particular kind of cancer. We are treating patients here who have nothing left to lose. I'm actually now look at Johns Hopkins University trying to follow these schemes. It's hard to force the oncologist to let the PSA levels go high. They always want to knock them down. But we think actually in certain cases, once we study their initial response functions, that we can make them live a lot longer and perhaps even prolong their lives. So the men we're working with right now are actually have no plan B and they've agreed to let us tinker with them using the tools of uh, adaptive uh, game theory and physical physics toys. Thanks a lot. I hear he's terrible, by the way. Right now, we're assuming that the carrying capacity and the absence of drugs are more or less the same for the sensitive and the resistant cells. And we're modulating the carrying capacity of the sensitive cells by delivering drugs. But you're right. It isn't necessarily true that the carrying capacities of the two cell types are the same. <coughs> so what we do is we deliver drugs to the patient, look at their response, and then model Unfortunately, now we have six degrees of freedom to try to model, right? That's the problem. That's a very difficult thing. So in order to try to have some hope of getting some sort of a, um, a, a way to model this, we sort of assume that the carrying capacities in the absence of drugs are the same. Not necessarily true, of course. So that's what I meant. There's weeds here um, that you really have to worry about. I wish we could get more information from our what we call training sets on the patients that we do right now. We have too many degrees of freedom. Yes? Uh, why is there a large change in the carrying capacity rather than the growth rate? Oh, OK. That's a great question. Because this particular drug does not change the growth rate. It doesn't change. That's, you're right. Toxic drugs change the growth rate. Since we're doing um, a testosterone uh, sampling, uh, Treatment. That changes carrying capacity. Does not change growth rate. Do you buy that or not? It, th that's that's a consequence of this particular drug. Okay. Uh, let's have the next speaker come up. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, hope I'm audible. Uh, so hi, I am Ashwin, a uh, third year PhD student in the lab of Dr. Harley and Dr. Bhargava in the Department of Chemical Engineering at UIUC. And today I'll be talking about label-free infrared imaging for metabolic measurements in an in vitro cancer model. Uh, just a brief outline of my talk. The final goal I'll be discussing is that uh, we can use infrared spectroscopy when you combine it with atomic force microscopy uh, for quantitative metabolic measurements in fixed uh, single cell uh, and the cancerous cells as well. Uh, considering a diverse audience, last night I tried my best to include a bit more background on the cancer metabolism stuff uh, for the context of this presentation. Uh, further on, I'll be talking a bit more about the tools used and the actual application side of it. Uh, it's a fairly common knowledge that uh, tumor microenvironment is uh, pretty heterogeneous with hundreds of different types of cells involved. Uh, which is kind of a primary driver for uh, the heterogeneity and tumor progression. Uh, overall, uh, 
this heterogeneity can be contributed in many ways, uh, mainly because of uh, cell cell and cell matrix interactions, differences in the stiffness, uh, different responses in patients uh, for same treatments as well, and differences in the metabolic status. Uh, when I started my grad school uh, in the Harley lab, the first three topics were already being worked on by the grad students. That's why I decided to pick the fourth one, which is differences in the metabolism statuses. In the cancer community, uh, Warburg effect is a term which is popularly known, which talks about how uh, cancer cell metabolism is different from normal cells. Uh, briefly talking about it, in case of normal cells, usually uh, glucose is taken down uh, and then by glycolysis broken down to pyruvate. In the presence of oxygen, it goes through mitochondria uh, to be broken down into ATP and carbon dioxide. In the absence of oxygen, this pyruvate is broken down to lactate. However, in cancer cells, the function of mitochondria majorly shuts down in the sense that in the presence or absence of oxygen, most of the pyruvate gets converted to lactate, uh, which is further used for production of more biomass and uh, cellular proliferation. Most popular techniques right now uh, to be able to study these metabolites better include isotope tracing and metabolomics. Just briefly discussing and touching upon these two, isotope tracing is basically when you uh, label one of the atoms from a metabolite with a uh, radially active element and uh, as it moves down the tumor progression cycle, uh, it is tracked by uh, fancy medical imaging equipments, one of them being PET imaging. Uh, and the other case, metabolomics, is when uh, you identify a rare patient phenotype, uh, try to take blood or cell samples, do liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry on that. Uh, and based on the results and the uh, quantitative analysis for different metabolites, you can uh, make a hypothesis and use different types of models for uh, testing that hypothesis. Major drawbacks, I would say, is that uh, isotope tracing is too expensive for exploratory studies in the sense that a few milliliters of uh, deuterated glucose can cost of the order of thousands of dollars. Uh, liquid chromatography usually is good enough for bulk level measurements, but when you are thinking about uh, targeted spatial analysis, it's not really that useful. In the Bhargava lab, we are big fans of this instrument for Fourier transform infrared imaging. Uh, where the idea is basically you use infrared light uh, which passes through your biological sample, goes to a detector. In the biological sample, different types of molecular vibrations are ongoing at all times and they absorb infrared light at different frequencies. Depending on different absorbances, you have a corresponding infrared spectra. This is a kind of a chemical signature of that specific molecule because, or the, the sample of interest mainly because uh, this kind of gives you an idea about different components in that specific sample in terms of lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates. Now, the one drawback of this instrument is the resolution because uh, FTIR works in the order of a few microns, can go down to about one microns, but that's the best, and it is not really useful if you are trying to target uh, small molecules like metabolites. So you can combine this with another instrument called atomic force microscopy which is popularly used to get uh, topological information of cells and when you combine the two it can go down to resolutions uh, as good as about 10 nanometers which is really useful for uh, tracking different metabolites uh, the way this instrument usually works is you have a cantilever which uh, hovers over your sample when you shine your ir light uh, it goes into the sample and there is thermal expansion depending on uh, the light being absorbed by the sample. This expansion can be uh, tracked by the cantilever and in this way you can combine the physical and the chemical details of your sample. Uh, right now, the main reason why uh, this is not extensively used in biology because there's many problems associated with noise, sensitivity and other stuff related to the cantilever. But one good news is that all of these problems are more or less uh, related to the deflection in the cantilever. Uh, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, the instrumentation side, but uh, in our lab, uh, Dr. Seth Kankal, who is now a postdoc in the Bhargava lab, his thesis uh, was to try and uh, solve many of these issues. And uh, based on what I understand from his thesis, explaining in simple terms, uh, what he did was he tried to install a piezo actuator underneath the sample and uh, established a closed control loop with the cantilever. So now what happens is any uh, noise or the external deflection you see because of external factors uh, are actually uh, recorded by the piezo and 
uh, you can nullify it uh, from your final signal and this modified version of the AFMR instrument we now call uh, Null Diffraction Infrared Setup or NDIR and what this does to the results is that uh, if you see the rightmost image the quality of images signal to noise ratio is much better uh, if you compare it to the two commercial systems uh, on the left. Once you have the instrument up and running uh, the next actual task which is the difficult part of my thesis is to prepare samples uh, which can be used on the instrument uh, and I say it's tricky because the samples go through uh, intense uh, large number of step steps to be finally used for imaging. Uh, you have cells first grown uh, in a 3D environment which is where uh, they love to grow. Uh, in hydrogels in this case, uh, you fix them to be able to preserve the protein structures. Uh, dehydrated uh, in graded ethanol steps uh, mainly because infrared light and water do not go well with each other so your samples need to be heavily dehydrated. Uh, after that is the infiltration step uh, where we use epoxy at the moment uh, so that it really gets in between all the cells uh, for better contrast and uh, once you embed it you get these uh, epoxy pucks where at the tip of the pucks you have your cell samples embedded. These need to be at 100 nanometer sections uh, which is the best uh, thickness what we or the best uh, thickness which gives better images at the moment and you can use an ultra micro tomb for that get uh, specific thickness samples and mount it on your sub substrate of interest. Now once your samples go through this whole protocol uh, you can get really good quality images uh, like these. Uh, the stuff lighting up in green are uh, different types of proteins and besides that you can also see uh, different ultra structures like uh, the whole nucleus, different nucleolus as well. Uh, these two cultures are specific uh, breast cells. Uh, the first one is just normal breast cell uh, in very initial stage of uh, cancer and this is a fully developed cancer cell line. And these are after 10 days of culture and as you can see they show really different phenotypes in the sense that uh, cancer cells tend to form spheroids at that culture duration, uh, normal cells don't really. Once you get these images, uh, one other problem is that you can cannot always get these quality images, mainly because your cell is uh, embedded in epoxy at really random positions. So when you actually start to cut stuff and you image it, uh, you don't really know where you are sectioning because the thickness is uh, as small as 100 nanometers. Uh, and it is also possible to many times just capture random cell debris or uh, cell samples which have a really terrible morphology because of the epoxy embedding. So we usually use this uh, in cycle with uh, the FTIR because FTIR can give you a really broad spectrum image of where your cell of interest is. So based on that you can really narrow down to a specific region and then start uh, imaging there. And just so you appreciate the quality of images AFMIR gives. Uh, this is actually the same region which I uh, showed you earlier. Uh, moving on from the actual imaging part to the spectral part, uh, any spectral region you see is actually a convolution of many different spectra, uh, mainly because there are thousands of stuffs in the cell which uh, absorb IR light. So it is really hard to pinpoint it to a specific region and say this peak corresponds to this specific uh, biological component. And especially when it comes to metabolites, it's a bit more tricky because even though all the key metabolites have a unique individual spectra, but most of them have important peaks uh, in similar regions. So if you were to make a mixture of all these metabolites and take infrared images, all of these peaks would coincide with each other. Uh, to get around that, uh, we are trying to develop a library of calibration curves for all the different metabolites of interest uh, of the order of a few hundreds, uh, 200 metabolites, which are very well known in cancers. Uh, so what you do here is uh, take the most important peak for that specific metabolite and get the relation between absorbance and concentration. So now when you are uh, taking an IR image for a mixture of different metabolites, uh, you know where each metabolite corresponds to because now you know the relation of absorbance and concentration for all of these metabolites. To be able to do this, uh, we follow this simple protocol where you first start off with a stock solution of a specific metabolite, say glucose. Uh, you prepare serial dilutions using a microfluidic device uh, just so that you do it in a high throughput, throughput and fast manner. You put it on a uh, glass light, take infrared images of uh, that metabolite and from there on you can uh, convert it to a calibration curve. 
and uh, right now we're in the process of doing this for many different types of metabolites. These are just some of them with their key peaks and R squared values of uh, the calibration curves. And just as an example, this is a curve for glucose uh, made from manual dilution and the dilution using microfluidics, which uh, agree really well with each other. Once this is done, uh, the last part is the actual experimental part where you have the cell cultures, you treat them with specific metabolite doses. Right now, we are starting to do that with different uh, glucose variants, D-glucose, 2-deoxyglucose, which have slightly different peaks. So hopefully that makes it a bit more easier to track. And once this whole thing is established and you get the whole protocol going, we can do it for many different types of metabolites. Uh, for example, uh, glioblastoma is one of the cancers, uh, a highly lethal form of brain cancer, which Harley Lab works in. And we have already identified a uh, few key metabolites from different sets of experiments, which should be targeted for uh, using this infrared imaging technique. Overall, to summarize, uh, right now we have optimized uh, sample preparation protocol for NDIR imaging and in the, are in the process of uh, developing a library of calibration curves for these different types of metabolites. And lastly, uh, the cell cultures are ongoing, the experiment is ongoing, and we are in the process of trying to parameterize and determine uh, what dose of metabolites to use, which makes it most physically relevant and stuff like that. Uh, that's it. In the end, I would like to thank uh, both my labs for and the lab mates for making all the experiments possible and thanks a lot to QCB Center and NSF for providing all the funding uh, to make these projects possible and thank you so much to the iPulse community because this is my first time presenting uh, in a talk, in a conference, so it's been a great experience at least until now. Thank you. That's a question I get at every posters and every talks I've attended. Uh, it's like principally how do you know if the metabolites are even there at the end because there's like such an intense protocol. So short answer is we don't know. Uh, the long answer would be that's one of the uh, protocols I presented. Uh, simultaneously I'm trying cryosectioning, high pressure freezing, like four or five different things uh, just to be able to see which one gives the highest sample quality. And then uh, there's always options like uh, deoxyglucose, for example, which the cells uptake and is not affected by any of the external processes and that remains in the cell, so it's much more easier to track. That's obviously not possible with all the metabolites, but it's a start and uh, hopefully one of the different techniques works well. So, uh, so for starters, even the I had to like spend a month to even get the gel material right. So I did not mention it here, but we right now use Matrigel, but I had initially started with gelatin and the same protocol works really terrible with gelatin. So even that uh, and changing the optimization, optimizing the times of each step, all of that gives like vastly different results. So right now with this technique, I'm trying to spend some time on that, but hopefully uh, other stuff like cryosectioning should work really well because there's like literally no step involved. You have your cells treated, you freeze them, you section them and image them. That's it. Okay, so uh, I'm Herbie Levine, and I'm gonna tell you about our continuing work on how chromatin microenvironments affect transcriptional dynamics. Now. Originally, I was going to talk about this in the context of E. coli and supercoiling and sort of more physics, and then I noticed that the organizers put me in a session on cancer, so I decided to talk about the other half of the work, which is the bottom half, which is histone marks, genetic networks, and its relationship to problems in cancer. Uh, if those, anybody interested in supercoiling, uh, the last the dust submitted to PNAS, actually, as of yesterday, it's accepted at PNAS. And so you can read our papers on, in, in, uh, on supercoiling. And then uh, we have a number of papers also on uh, looking at histone marks. So I need to tell you what a histone mark is for those of you who do not work on chromatin structure. Uh, chromatin in eukaryotic cells consists of, of course, the DNA. And the DNA is wrapped around these 
yellow balls, which are octamers or proteins. Uh, they're, hist they're called histones, and the structure is called a nucleosome. And it's well known that you can modify these proteins. You can add various chemical groups to their tails, and the modification of those histone proteins will affect the, the rate at which genes can be transcribed in various kinds. And these changes, which are collectively called epigenetic changes, are very important in things like how plastic cells are, how if you give the cell a stimulus, how it will be able to rapidly change what genes it expresses in order, for example, to differentiate into a new type of cell during development. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about this in the context of a very well-known cell phase transition uh, in cancer, uh, which is called EMT, standing for epithelial mesenchymal transition. And essentially, this transition was proposed to answer the following question. How do you get from a primary tumor, which is denoted here in these green cells that are all making some spherical-looking blob of cancer cells that stick to each other and aren't going anywhere, how do you get from that to cells that are able to move through the body, make it through the bloodstream, land somewhere else, and start a secondary tumor, otherwise known as a metastatic growth? And the reason this is important is that we have many things which successfully treat primary tumors, surgery, radiation, other things. We have very few things that successfully treat metastatic tumors. Once tumor spreads throughout your body, you know, essentially you have to give some type of pervasive drug therapy. These don't work in many cases, as Bob described to us. And essentially, you know, your chances become much more limited for how many years you're going to live. So the answer to how this transition takes place was borrowed from developmental biology, where it was known that cells could undergo a transition where they would become mesenchymal, they would become motile, starting from being immotile, it would enable them to undergo this transition, and this has a number of interesting implications, which is not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the fact that when people began to look at the single cell level and began to investigate what it took for cells to undergo this transition, they discovered that there was an essential role for epigenetic type interactions. The ones I described to you in terms of changing the structure of the chromatin, the chromatin in this case in the promoter regions of the genes that have to change in order for the cells to undergo this transition. So here is an example of a paper, of an early paper that shows this. Uh, this paper uh, it's written in sort of cancer biology language, but you have various cells, so HMLE is basically breast cells, and you have an inducible expression of a gene that will induce EMT in, the, in this laboratory setting. It's cell, the, the gene is called twist. And you apply this inducible thing. You add a drug. It turns on the gene twist. It tries to push the cell towards EMT. And if you study using flow cytometry or anything else, if you study the transition, you discover that you know, 80% of your cells are cooperative. They undergo this transition. 20% of your cells refuse to obey. They just sit there, do nothing. They don't realize that you all of a sudden tried to push them into a new fate. So these people investigated what was the difference. They didn't do it very quantitatively, uh, but they actually suggested in this paper a few years ago that what was the difference was related to a global epigenetic program, uh, they saw that if you looked in some detail at the epigenetic structures of the cells that could undergo a transition and the ones that could not, they looked different. The accessibility of some of the genes that needed to be turned on to make this mesenchymal program happen were much more limited in the cells that refused to undergo the transition. There was a limitation to how adaptable they were in terms of the accessibility uh, of their chromatin. Now, you can ask, how do we study this? I'm a theorist, as you all know by now. Uh, and we study this using genetic networks. Here is just an example of genetic networks from a paper we wrote a number of years ago. This is a combination of you know, the blue are proteins, are transcription factors. The reds are microRNA. We heard about microRNA. They're essential for <laughs> regulating this particular type of transition in mammalian cells. You can study the different possible states of a network like this. You see that on the right-hand side. And you see, roughly speaking, there are mostly two states. The 
the red, blue, in terms of what genes are expressed are epithelial cells, the blue, red are mesenchymal, and you also have some intermediate possibilities, which I'm not going to discuss in detail. And I should mention that the first attempts to take this model and ask what needs to be added to it to take into account these epigenetic degrees of freedom was done with an ex-student of mine, Mohit, and because they're sitting at the ICTP, I had to point out that Mohit was one of two winners last year of the ICTP Young Investigator from the uh, Developing World uh, Prize. As far as we know, it's the first time somebody working on physics of living systems, biological physics, has been awarded this particular physics prize. So uh, he was the first person who we began to think about this question with a few years ago. And the real breakthrough for us came from a different experimental system, uh, which is a little, bit, uh, a little bit mangled here. But there was an experiment that we discovered uh, in 2020 and was eventually published in 2022 from Bob Weinberg's lab at MIT, which for those of you who work on cancer, Bob Weinberg literally wrote the book on cancer. Uh, and the experiment was different than the one before. The one before just asked, you know, what, you know, what happens when you apply a stimulus to cells and you just measure what happens. This one took the same experimental idea a step further. They said, let's take cells that are resistant to this transition. Let's take those cells and let's figure out what we can do to make them adaptable. So let's take a positive approach, in this case using a CRISPR screen, what can we knock out in order to make the cells that previously are not able to undergo the transition, what can we do to them to make them now able to undergo the transition? So you do an entire CRISPR screen, this is a new tech, relatively new technology where you can knock out all sorts of different proteins and you can see the consequences, you can identify which ones are most effective, the two knockouts that were most effective at restoring the ability of the cells to undergo this transition were epigenetic enzymes, enzymes that were known specifically to modulate these histone marks, in particular known to modulate histone marks around some of the transcription factors that were in the genetic networks that had been used to describe the transition in the work of the, of the community over the last decade or so. And so uh, I'll just mention two, what, what those two enzymes are. If you look at a typical promoter region, I guess, is there a, is there a pointer on this thing? Uh, is it at the top? No. Yes, okay, yeah. So if you look at some type of region, a promoter of some gene, for example, ZEB1 is a, a very traditional transcription factor which induces EMT, that you can silence it by adding a histone bar called H3K27ME3, which you don't want to, you know, I can read the code for you, but it just stands for the third histone, the 27th lysine, adding three methyl groups doesn't matter, it's something which silences the gene, makes it harder to express that gene, and PRC2 is an enzyme which, under, which makes that transition happen, which you know, just en enzymatically adds the methyl group in that location, and this was one of the knockouts that was identified in the CRISPR screen, and the other one was KM2D, KM2D is a methyl transferase, it adds a different methyl group, a methyl group is then an activating mark. So the interesting thing about this experiment that I only have time to touch on for about a minute or two is the fact that they saw that the two leading ends, the two leading knockouts that would make the cells more adaptable were both connected to epigenetic regulation, both connected to histone marks. The thing that was surprising was one of them was supposed to be an activator and the other is supposed to be inhibitor and knocking out the activator and, or, or knocking out the inhibitor had the same effect. You went from nothing to active either if you knock out the activator or knock out the inhibitor. So I don't have time to talk about how that works in detail. We of course created a model of that. The basic principle of the model is that you cannot think of epigenetic regulation in the same way you think of genetic regulation. Epigenetic regulation is something that's happening globally. You have these enzymes and they have to bind to different regions of the genome, and there are hundreds or thousands of different sites along the genome that will try to attract PRC2 to, mod to modify epigenetic marks. And when you change various epigenetic enzymes, you have to understand where, you know, how you, or particular promoter that you care about, because you care about this genetic circuit, 
how that's interacting with all the other parts of the genome in terms of competition for that resource, the resource being the epigenetic enzyme. So you can, for example, just to show you pictorially, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, what happens in the baseline before you do anything, you have PRC2, you have KM2D, the Z promoter is off in those cells, and that's because you have this large amount of blue which is inhibiting the promoter. And then all of a sudden you go and knock out something like the, act, you knock out the inhibitor, you knock out PRC2, and you would think that that meant all of a sudden your gene would be activated, but actually it doesn't happen. Your gene loses the PRC2, it loses the inhibitor, but all the activator gets sucked up by all the other sites of the genome that used to have PRC2 and now are free to have this, you know, competitive activator, and you actually stay in a, in a sort of neutral state. You don't get activated. And so also, if you, whoops, if you go the other way, and if you go the other way, and you knock out the uh, activator, actually the same thing happens. Now, you would think you would be inhibited even more strongly, but in fact what happens is the inhibitor that used to be on your site is now free to go everywhere else in the genome, and actually you lose your inhibition by knocking out the, you know, by, by knocking out the activator. So it's quite in non-intuitive. You have to work through this resource competition. You can actually show that depending on, ah, come on, depending on exactly how all the parameters work out, genes can have any one of a number of three behaviors. They can have their highest expression in the baseline. They can have the highest expression if you knock out the activator, and they can have their highest expression if you knock out the inhibitor. We looked at a genome-wide survey of all the genes that had this promoter structure and discovered, you know, 67% were what you would thought happened. They're highest if you knock out the inhibitor. 14% were highest if you knock out the activator, and then the control was 11%. It just turns out in these, in these cells that the EMT genes, the ones you need to turn on for this transition, are ones where you get the highest level if you knock out the actual inhibitor. So you can explain the data. I won't, you know, go through all the details. There's, we can then make a model which looks like a combined genetic network together with a epigenetic promoter circuit, where now the promoter circuit modulates the ability of the transcription factors to affect each other, and you can then study the effects of this network. You can match it to the experimental data, you know, as we, we always try to do. And you can make various predictions, some of which have already been tested, some of which uh, are still in the process of being tested. Uh, the experimental work is being carried on now by uh, Yun Zhang, who uh, uh, was in Bob Weinberg's lab and now has gone, uh, moved back to Beijing, uh, started his own lab, and is continuing some of these experimental systems. I should mention, I didn't put it in this slide, that in subsequent work to this, this work, uh, we went back to experiments where you look at cells, again, you give cells protocols, you go back to the previous type of experiment where you don't do any modifications, you just look at different cells at the single cell level and say, these ones undergo transitions, these ones partially undergo transitions, these ones do not undergo transitions, and you work backwards and using single cell RNA-seq methods, you try to figure out what were the differences in those cells that predicted what they would do when you gave them the signal of trying to undergo the transition, and it turned out the results were completely consistent with the results here, that the ones that refused to undergo the transitions were the ones that actually had very limited amounts of expression of exactly those epigenetic enzymes that if you go and, you know, have normal expression but then knock them out, then you get the same, the same answer. You can, you can work backwards uh, using a positive method, or you can use data analysis on time depend on time sequenced RNA seq to work backwards, and you can get a similar finding about exactly how these epigenetic factors are related to um, being able or unable to undergo these transitions. Now, uh, so let me conclude uh, just a summary. Uh, so, plasticity with respect to being able to undergo EMT can strongly depend on a new wrinkle in trying to understand genetic systems. The new wrinkle is it's not just transcription factors, it's not just transcription factors and translational factors like microRNA. 
Uh, it's also the role of the, what some people call the epigenetic landscape, which is the epigenetic playing field upon which these genetic systems can, you know, do their thing and activate or inhibit each other. Calling it an epigenetic landscape is, I think, sometimes misleading because that imagines that that landscape is a sort of fixed topography in which you can uh, do this work on. Uh, in fact, the epigenetic landscape is a dynamic landscape which is coupled reciprocally back to the genetic system. So you have to create a new set of models understanding how that works, and we've been doing that with some initial surprises as I tried to relate to you. Uh, they act globally, that's, you know, they, they don't just act locally, and uh, we have shown, at least in the simplest cases, how one can extend our computational ideas to take this into account. The people who did the work, of course, uh, uh, the people on, on the top row are, are various people who did some, you know, some of these people work mostly on the supercoiling problem. Uh, the person who worked mostly on the, the work I described to you is uh, uh, Muhammad Ali Aradawi, who was a postdoc at Northeastern, now works for a biotech company, and also Shabam Tripathi, who's now uh, left, uh, was, a post, was a graduate student, now is a postdoc in Yale Immunology, and uh, together with Yun Zhang, who now moved to, to Beijing, and together with longtime collaborators, uh, Jose, uh, Eduardo Sontag at Northeastern, the help of Bob Weinberg's lab at MIT, Mani, uh, who is an experimental cancer biologist collaborator, and the most recent work done together with Francisca Misha at the Dana Farber Cancer Center. Uh, thank you for your attention. I should mention uh, this paper that Preston is alluding to, I think in Nature maybe two months ago probably, uh, there was a very, it was a paper which is, it's surprising but not surprising in a sense. In other words, we all, I mean there was, a, there was an argument a long time ago of is cancer a genetic disease or is it some other kind of disease. There's a famous uh, argument where, you know, cancer was a genetic disease on one side and the other side I think a famous biologist said cancer is a disease of genes like a traffic jam is a disease of cars. And, you know, it's, in other words, that the, that's not the single genes, it's not the mutate. Now, the, the mutation picture won out for a number of reasons, because most of the time, when you ask what initiates cancer, you see that various genes, which we call driver genes, usually the ones governing uh, uncontrolled growth, are mutated. We know that there's strong correlations with, with things like carcinogens, like smoking and other carcinogens, you know, going out in the sun too much and getting yourself uh, uh, melanoma. So, so the picture that cancer is mostly driven initially by having mutations in these driver genes is the picture that generally won out in the cancer community. This paper two months ago pointed out, of course, in, in a specific case, that that may not be the only way to initiate cancer. You may have cancer which is initiated purely by some epigenetic breakdown, some irregularity in gene expression, that can also cause uncontrolled growth because, you know, it's not just mutated genes, it's the way the genes behave to give you the phenotype that's what's important. So they actually showed in some particular case, they argued that they had found an example where actually the epigenetic regulation was the thing that led to the cancer, was, was, there was no mutational initiating event, which is very surprising, but at some level, but is not inconsistent with the idea that it, it's, you know, mutations are not, you know, are 
usually relevant. They're usually the thing that enables things, cancers that are not enabled in normal cells, but other, other things are equally important. For example, uh, we've argued for many years, and you know, with, I would say, I don't know, how much, what percentage of, of cancer biologists agree with us, that the process of metastasis, which is what I, my group really focuses on, is usually not associated with direct mutations. You not just mutate and all of a sudden become metastatic, that the ability to metastasize is an inherent genetic program governed by the gene circuit and the epigenetics of the gene circuit that takes place under a background of mutations but is not directly caused by getting a metastatic gene. So that part of it, I think, we already agreed. The fact that initiation is possible also without that is, I think, it's much more surprising, but not totally crazy. I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs>